For avid anime viewers, the dread that looms in anticipation of every attempted Hollywood adaptation of a beloved classic comes as naturally as hunger or thirst. Like a child who fucked around with a stovetop and found out, the fear of being burned again is visceral, instinctive. But even still, even in a weeby world cursed by Dragon Ball Evolution, Scar Jost in the Shell, and There Is No Movie in Ba Sing Se, few phrases in history have ever inspired as much otaku consternation as Netflix Cowboy Bebop. A big part of that comes from Netflix's reputation for messing this sort of thing up, which they've mostly brought upon themselves by slapping their originals branding on terrible Japanese-made shows and movies that they've merely licensed, like Mob Psycho 100 and FMA. Though the same logic does put the Erased and Alice in Borderland dramas firmly in their win column. Until now, the only live-action anime thing they've actually had a hand in producing stateside was the Death Note movie, which definitely was not great and definitely wasn't Death Note, but at least tried and occasionally succeeded at being its own cheesy B-horror thing. Which is arguably disrespectful to the source material, sure, but personally I'd rather watch a goofy alt-universe fan film that people actually had fun making than a soulless carbon copy of a thing I've already seen. With that in mind, I've actually been feeling cautiously optimistic about Netflix taking on things like Yu Yu Hakusho and even One Piece after I saw how hard they nailed that casting. At least compared to J.J. Abrams doing Your Name, it feels like a safer bet. But even still, every time I've thought about live-action Bebop or looked at the shot comparisons that they've been posting on Twitter, that palpable dread has loomed back up. Which probably has more to do with a different reputation. The one that precedes Cowboy Bebop itself as one of the absolute unimpeachable greatest anime of all time. Which I think it fully deserves. Nothing man-made is truly perfect, but Cowboy Bebop comes as timelessly close to being a perfect anime as Who Framed Roger Rabbit does to a perfect movie and Super Metroid does to a perfect game. The more you understand about the technology and artistic processes used to create anime back in 1998, the more you come to realize that what you're seeing on screen in Cowboy Bebop is a genuine miracle. Like, notice how little you notice the background CGI here compared to almost every anime that's been made since. And Bebop's opening has been one of the only two universally acceptable answers to what is the best anime OP for over two decades now. I mean, guys, they made these motion graphics with their hands. Netflix editors working with computers in current year couldn't even get that little flicker on the first line that introduces Spike right. And on top of that, the original opening is absolutely jam-packed with hidden meaning that I've analyzed extensively in a sister piece to this video that I released last week. But I suppose I should talk about other good parts of Cowboy Bebop that aren't just an excuse to plug my other content. Like how every episode consistently features hand-drawn and painted action and character animation with a level of detail, fluidity, and expressive musical energy that other anime, even modern big-budget digital ones, condition you to expect a few times a season at best. Half of Deku's fights aren't nearly as technically impressive as most shots of Spike and Faye just fiddling around with the interfaces in their cockpits. And speaking of those interfaces, they speak to an obsession with technically accurate, forward-thinking, humanistic world-building that permeates the entire show. Cowboy Bebop's production design team didn't just think about how things in this world would work, they thought about how they'd break, be rebuilt, customized, and worn in by the people using them. And it's not just the technology. Look at the background art in any location any character calls home, be it a bar, a tiny capsule hotel, or a trucker's space cab, and you'll spy countless specific details speaking to the occupant's personalities. Cowboy Bebop builds an entire universe out of disparate film and music genres, with each episode adopting a different style to suit its subject matter and give each of the people and places the Bebop crew visits in their adventures an incredibly distinct 
distinct identity. Yet, at the same time, countless subtle world-building and character-developing threads woven throughout these episodes, along with a persistent undercurrent of black comedy, allow that patchwork setting to cohere into a surprisingly consistent and sprawling whole. Every episode of Cowboy Bebop is wildly different, yet every episode is unmistakably Cowboy Bebop. The show's been accused by some detractors of merely parroting the stylistic overtures of the many films and TV shows from which it draws inspiration and to which it pays homage, but the truth is it remixes those things, like a master musician taking phrases and hooks from other artists in other genres and incorporating the texture of their musical ideas into a new sequence that says something wholly fresh and original. Space jazz. Some critics and contrarians have said Cowboy Bebop's cast is poorly written because they barely grow or change over the course of their adventures and repeat the same mistakes from episode to episode. I say that's the point. Spike Spiegel is doomed to die because he is fundamentally incapable of accepting loss and refuses to learn the lesson of where that leads no matter how many times it catches up to a bounty he was just about to cash in on. Cowboy Bebop uses the sticky status quo nature of episodic narratives in contrast with its light touch serialization to create a deeply fatalistic philosophical exploration of the human condition, with its ultimate lesson being that to survive in this woolong poisoned bitch of a world, you have to learn to embrace change and roll with punches. Be like water, a wise man might say. Which is a philosophy that I'd like to try to live by with this review of the new thing. I can't change that Netflix's version exists now, that the multiple days it spent trending in their top 10 all but guarantee it a second season, or that in today's media landscape it's almost certain to overshadow the vastly superior original anime. But I can kick this video off by singing the anime's praises as loudly as possible in hopes of convincing newcomers that the new show is no substitute for its near-perfect inspiration, and I can at least give this new thing an honest shot at impressing or disappointing me with what it actually is instead of just blindly hating it for what it's not. It's been clear pretty much since it was announced that Flixboy Netbop would need to be very different from the original to work at all. The dictates of live-action filmmaking restrict how much time its cast can spend in space, for starters, and create significant challenges for realizing many of the anime's characters. Ein has to be a real, adorable trained animal now, for instance, incapable of the occasionally uncannily human movements the original had. Faye's original costume would have quickly fallen to pieces in any moderately heavy action scene, too, though her new one does cover more than is structurally necessary for other reasons that we'll get into. And, of course, Radical Edward, the gender-ambiguous semi-Looney Tune tween hacker prodigy, would have to be radical reimagined from the ground up to work in live action at all. I mean, can you imagine a director asking a real actor to emulate this performance in real life? How insanely awkward and cringy would that be? Spike! <laughs> Spike Spiegel! Wake up! I have a job for you! Oh. Oh dear. <laughs> Okay, let's not pretend this is the first time you've seen that clip. It's been passed through every corner of the internet as the definitive proof that this remake sucks. And with good reason. That scene sure does suck. But it's also basically just the post-credits Marvel teaser for the season, and it's Ed's only on-screen appearance in the entire thing, so using it to dismiss the entire thing outright is pretty unfair. That said, the scene is indicative of this remake's second most glaring problem, namely that every time it tries to play a plot point or character from the anime straight, it falls flat on its face. The opening scene of the show echoes the iconic opening fight of the Cowboy Bebop movie, where Spike, wearing headphones, wanders into a hostage situation and acts casually oblivious to get the drop on the bad guys. 
Except instead of a tightly packed convenience store, the show sets the scene in a wide open casino floor that nobody would casually wander into ever. And instead of a quick trick with a party popper, Spike's attack consists of slowly and dramatically bicycle kicking a poker chip at a guy who already had a gun pointed at him, and definitely would have shot him in the time it took to do that. Then the fight keeps escalating, with Spike and Jet accidentally popping bounty heads left and right, until a dude pops out of the bathroom with some sort of super space cannon type thing that blows a hole in the space station's hull, and Jet saves Spike from being lost in the vacuum at the last second by activating a bulkhead that, uh, only seals off that one wall of slot machines for some reason. As opposed to the anime movie's skilled combatant who used calculated deception to turn a hopeless fight around, this scene presents Spike as a tactless moron who cares more about looking cool than not getting shot and can get away with that thanks to plot armor. In the original series, every time someone pulled out a gun, it was kind of a big deal and people definitely died when they were killed. This scene creates the impression that this world is somehow even cartoonier than the anime, with mistakes carrying fewer consequences and absurdly convenient outs to every problem the heroes create for themselves just lying close at hand. It's not the strongest tone-setting move they could have made, is what I'm saying. The rest of the episode is more or less a straightforward riff on Session 1, Asteroid Blues, with Faye mixed in as a rival bounty hunter because introducing a main character after the pilot confuses and frightens American audiences or something. Honestly, she barely affects the episode's storyline beyond helping out with a shootout against the Syndicate, in which a gunman recognizes Spike, inciting the plot. But I honestly can't think of a single less effective way to introduce this version of Faye to the anime's audience than tacking her on to a remade anime story that's already being ruined in every other respect. The tale of Katarina and Asimov and their flight from the Syndicate with a baby bump full of red eye remains mostly unchanged, from Spike's initial friendly greeting and the fight that follows it right up to their tragic final moments. But in contrast to how the anime subtly implies that Spike might have a personal motivation for his interest in the couple, the Netflix show inserts its first Julia flashback here, followed by Spike straight up saying, you remind me of someone. And in its rendition of the anime session's wordlessly tragic finale, where Spike and Katarina said everything they needed to in a few meaningful glances, the show has them talk over Road to the West. And that is far from the only crime that it commits against Yoko Kano's original score, or for the new stuff she wrote for it, for that matter. In the cold open of episode two, as Jed is trying and failing to catch the teddy bomber, the opening notes of Tank start playing, leading organically into the credits, which then play the opening notes of Tank again, minus the spoken word bit we've already heard. That is, without question, one of the most embarrassingly sloppy edits I've seen in anything let alone a high-budget prestige TV thing. And what's really wild is it's not even the worst part of the episode. That would be Vicious, who is the worst part of every episode from here on out, and maybe the worst part of Netflix, period. Unlike most of the actors in this show, Alex Hassel is incredibly poorly cast and cannot sell either the quiet menace that defined the original Vicious or the loud rage that defines this new one to save his life. It's rare to see an actor be this wooden and this hammy at the same time. And that issue is only exacerbated by him being given the worst lines of anyone in the cast. Except maybe Julia. You may as well put a bullet in me now because you will never be man enough to stand up for yourself. Don't you ever tell me <laughs> I'm not man enough. 
Admittedly, the anime's version of Vicious wasn't much of a character to begin with, but he didn't really have to be. He worked perfectly well as a bit of spooky spice the show could sprinkle sparingly into Spike's story sessions to give them bite and tension. Just like how Julia worked as a somewhat idealized symbol of Spike's tragic past, right up till we actually meet her and his sad dream comes crashing up against an even sadder reality. Neither character needed to be expanded upon, but the current binge model of television demands more overt, on-the-next-episode type hooks than the anime's semi-episodic structure really allowed, and their ongoing storyline was the most convenient way to add that element in. I can see what led the showrunners to build the season's B-plot around Vicious and Julia and flesh their characters out accordingly, but I really wish they hadn't. Anime Vicious knew how to do precisely two things, katana murder and betrayal. But the live action one isn't any more complex than that. He just replaces his two things with impotent, toxic, masculine rage and daddy issues. With the daddy in question being one of the syndicate elders who he murders in his big coup at the end. Because in binge TV land, everything's gotta be connected to everything else. Julia plays the dollar store Skyler to Vicious's Walmart Walter White, starting as an innocent jazz singer at the Syndicate's favorite nightclub, lured in by his wealth and char... good look... nice car. But the violence of the world she's naively let herself be dragged into, and Vicious's unreliability as a protector, push her to change, becoming colder, more ruthless, and more determined to survive at any cost over time. Which might have been more compelling if she had less stilted dialogue, or was playing off anyone besides Vicious. As it stands, though, every time the show cuts to them plotting together, or to her plotting against his plots once she finds out Spike's alive, is just plain excruciating. The show is pretty bad whenever it lifts plot lines from the anime, be it Asteroid Blues or Piero LeFou, even with Josh Randall absolutely killing it as the crazed clown assassin. But that's mostly just because we have better executed versions of those scenes and storylines to compare those cosplay skit recreations to. The vicious and Julia shit is just bad all on its own. Whenever those two are on screen, this is one of the worst TV shows I've ever seen. Even in how it's shot, weirdly. The show has too many Dutch angles to begin with, but vicious scenes in particular are straight up Battlefield Earth, and they unfortunately dominate the season's plot. But the weird thing is, there's actually a pretty good TV show buried inside that garbage, about a found family of affably jerky bounty hunters tooling around the solar system, stopping crimes and trading quips. Not a great TV show, mind you, and definitely not Cowboy Bebop, but a decent American TV approximation of the anime's general vibe. Like, there's McDonald's signs in this show, guys, and they nailed Big Shot. which are far from the only places they paid attention to the little things. In general, both the sets and CG models of Bebop's various ships are remarkably well made and full of exactly the sort of tiny technical details the original animators delighted in including. Those ships, unfortunately, aren't used much beyond providing a place for conversation. Almost all of the episodes take place on foot in various cities around Mars, with most of the action set either on the streets or against generic industrial backdrops. But on the bright side, that action is generally more competent than the intro would leave you to believe. I except when Vicious is on screen again, they... They really just do not know how to edit a samurai fight. A lot of the conversations are pretty fun too, though. At its worst, the crew banter in the show tries way too hard to be quirky, current, and referential. Going over the plan to fight Piero LeFou in rhyme, for instance, is a lot much. Making herpes jokes in a universe where they can regrow people's arms is pretty damn stupid too. And while you've all heard it already... Sounds to me like blackmail. I'm right it is, because, Judd, you are black and you are male. It bears infinite repeating that that is 
just god-awful writing on every conceivable level. Though also, infinite kudos to that actress for delivering that corny, horny line as convincingly as she does. Gita Jackson over at Vice wrote a fantastic piece about why this dialogue is so bad and how it all traces back to Buffy the Vampire Slayer and sitcoms before it. But sometimes, for the majority of two episodes even, the script manages to get out of its own way, tone down the Whedonisms, and just let the characters be themselves. And while themselves are not really Spike, Fay, or Jet in any respect but general attitude, they do have their own depth and the way they play off each other, the rhythm of their dialogue, and the often inane, plot-irrelevant bullshit they get to talking about does feel in step with the vibe and atmosphere of the anime's hangout scenes. It can be a bit uncanny, as though Spike's siphoned off some of Jet's classy demeanor, while Jet in turn has taken on some of his partner's slobby slackerisms, but many ingredients of the Bebop crew stew are here, albeit in a form that works better with a laugh track. And while it isn't Cowboy Bebop, I really cannot emphasize that enough, it does work well enough if you think of it as either a fan show in the vein of a fox in space, or as a Cowboy Bebop-inspired sci-fi action comedy thing. The kind of thing that, under any other name, Bebop fans might even recommend to their content-starved comrades. But, and I can't emphasize this enough either, it only works that way when it's doing its own Bebop-inspired thing instead of Bebop's thing. When the bidet scene dropped, for instance, there was much fan trepidation about how, instead of a virus that turns people into monkeys, the space warriors unleash a bioweapon that turns people into trees. But when you actually see the effect in action, it makes for pretty fucking effective body horror. And the weapon they used to do it, a spore pod used to rapidly terraform planets and asteroids ahead of their colonization, actually answers a world-building question the anime left hanging. That's pretty cool! And while the Space Warrior end of that plot ultimately just ends up being a lame, toned-down rehash of the anime as per usual, it does at least provide a backdrop to develop this version of Faye's character, which is more squarely focused on her cryosleep amnesia and rediscovering her past than the anime version's gambling addiction and money troubles, and integrate her into Spike and Jet's dynamic, where she fits pretty neatly. John Cho, Mustafa Shakir, and Daniela Pineda have seriously powerful, natural chemistry with each other that elevates even some of their cheesiest dialogue. Heck, even that bit where they're planning to fight LeFou in rhyme has its charming moments. I, like many Bebop fans, was worried about how 50-year-old John Cho would fare as 27-year-old Spike Spiegel, and this version is noticeably more mature and world-weary than he was in the anime, something you really notice in that flashback episode. He's also totally missing the Eastern spiritualist aspect of Spike's personality, which is a shame because every time anime Spike bursts out the holistic medicine, it's absolutely hysterical. But as far as that effortlessly cool, perpetually exhausted, yet paradoxically perky Spike Spiegel affect goes, that seems to come as naturally to Cho as breathing, even without knowing Spike's supposed to have a fake eye, which, yes, Jacob Faku, I do agree is unforgivable. But something else I thought would be unforgivable about this show, the, the fact that they definitely won't kill off Spike because they're planning to go for multiple seasons and who hires and fires John Cho, actually seems like it might be acceptable for this version of the character. Episode 6, Binary Two-Step, riffs on the concepts of the anime's brain scratch to trap Spike in a simulated loop based on his memories of Julia and Vicious, where an AI tries to convince him to let her go because that'll let it take over his brain somehow. It's not the most coherent setup, but it does allow the show to confront Spike with the cold reality of what failing to let go of Julia will ultimately do to him, a lot less subtly than all the warnings he ignores in the anime, leaving him thinking about that after the episode's done, which creates the possibility for him to grow past that before it's too late. I think I'd actually be more upset if they still tried to end the show with a bang after all this. It just wouldn't feel earned anymore. Though I wouldn't be nearly as upset as I am about the other thing they did with Julia. 
But we're talking about the crew right now. There's no other way to put this. Mustafa Shakir is Jet Black. It's straight up uncanny how close his interpretation of the character is to Bo Billingsley's, especially considering how much they changed about that character. Live action Jed is a divorced dad now, which does sort of jive with his anime role as Spike and Faye's dad and Ayn and Ed's roommate, and does lead to one really funny gag where he's hollow projecting into his daughter's dance recital, oblivious to a crazy fight Spike's having behind him. But outside that, this whole part of the story just feels like a cheap, generic way to tug at American heartstrings. Also, as Tristan Glass Reflection noted, it's pretty much exactly Ant-Man. They also royally bunged up Black Dog Serenade, turning what was a thrilling prison ship riot into bog-standard cop drama warehouse investigation bullshit, while making Udai, one of the anime's scariest villains, look like a complete pansy. And yet, Shakir's screen presence is so strong, so unmistakably jet, that all that feels tolerable. Plus, the B-plot, where Spike and Faye bond back on the Bebop by comparing scars and swapping war stories as they watch Big Shot, is more than entertaining enough to pick up that slack, making this the first genuinely okay episode. And not the last, but let's talk about Faye. Daniela Pineda's Faye Valentine is easily the biggest departure from her anime counterpart in ways that are apparent just looking at her. The showrunners apparently felt that the whole skin showing, seduction weaponizing, femme fatale with the heart of gold thing anime Faye had going on was outdated, and I vehemently disagree with that assessment. Fujiko Mine, who inspired Faye, is one of the most enduringly timeless characters in all of modern media, and they're both more three-dimensional characters than most women on American TV today. That said, I was willing to accept the choice to change Faye, despite my disagreement, if they at least made their new version of her interesting in her own way. And I think they did pull that off. This Faye is a cheeky, foul-mouthed con woman with a heart of gold, which isn't the most original archetype, but her cryo-sleep-induced amnesia adds some distinct dimension to it and sets up a seriously fascinating explanation of how she became that person. The live-action version of Whitney Haggis Matsumoto, the con man anime Faye fell for when she first woke up, is a con woman now, a brash, fast-talking, faux-classy cougar with serious charisma in her own right, who tricked Faye into thinking she was her mom and then here's where it gets interesting, started getting lost in that role. Faye's furious about ultimately being abandoned and tricked by her, but at the same time, Whitney really is the closest thing she's ever had to a mom that she knows of, and in the series' best episode by far, number seven, Galileo Hustle, we get to watch them reconcile those two wildly disparate sides of their relationship. Instead of wasting time with flashbacks, the way they act around each other now tells us more about how they were back then, and to balance all that heavy emotional stuff out, the episode features an absolutely hysterical villain in The Iron Mink, the aggressively horny and hornily aggressive arms-dealing ex-husband whom Whitney asks Faye's help in escaping. This all builds up to one of the funniest jokes I've seen on TV in ages, followed by one of the few emotional scenes in this series that feels properly earned and really lands, when Faye finally gets her hands on an old VHS of her forgotten childhood self. Daniela Pineda's character is not Faye Valentine, and she's not as strong a character as Faye Valentine, but that episode wouldn't be as good as it is if she didn't have some real depth behind her, and a distinct voice beyond all the Joss Whedon nonsense the writers cram into her mouth. Welcome to the ads, motherfuckers! When the writers are trying too hard like that, she can definitely be one of the show's most grating characters, but when she's not, she's one of its best, and every scene of her, Spike, and or Jet just hanging out has a wonderful energy about it that, again, can't say this enough, isn't Cowboy Bebop, but does feel like a sci-fi sitcom I could really get into. It only strikes that balance for a few episodes, and 
only really takes advantage of it for two, right before pissing it all away with three straight installments of the Vicious and Julia No Variety Hour, but those episodes do prove it's possible to create good television with this cast and setting. And if they can just do that ten more times next season instead of what they did this one, then this would be a good TV show. Which it isn't right now, to be clear. <laughs> That finale features some of the stinkiest garbage to ever waft out of my TV set, and I'm including happy science movies in that statement. The Ed scene isn't even the worst part. In lieu of grabbing Faye to get to Spike like he does in the anime, Vicious kidnaps Jet's daughter instead, which leads to this whole dramatic falling out between the crew so next season's premiere can be a generic getting the band back together story. But of course, before that can happen, they gotta go to the church and do the thing. Starting with an inversion where Spike and Jet have been captured and tied to pillars, and Faye's the one who has to rescue them, which actually works pretty well for this version of the character, and the effects of the red tail blowing out the stained glass and cutting down gangsters look pretty damn good, but that doesn't last long, and pretty soon the scene's down to Spike and Vicious trading bullets, quips, and out-of-place anime quotes. This of course leads to a shot-for-shot -shot recreation of their iconic standoff, which kicks off with a generic samurai flute sting as Vicious draws his sword. That is a straight-up insult to the anime's iconic sound design, but a far greater insult occurs moments later when, instead of Spike throwing a grenade to escape Vicious, Julia emerges from the shadows to shoot her husband and reveal that she's decided to become the big crime boss lady now. She asks Spike to join her, rule the solar system as mommy and boy toy. He refuses, so she shoots him, and only then do they do their totally soulless rendition of Greenbird. There is a small part of me that thinks evil Julia could be used in interesting ways, and hey, at least she shut Vicious up, but pairing such a wild departure from the anime's story with such atrocious butchery of the anime's single most iconic scene is about the single most effective way I can think of to ensure that every Cowboy Bebop fan everywhere will hate this version of Julia forever, no matter what the show does with her. And somehow, that episode's still not the worst it gets. Neither is the crew straight up abandoning Ayn after finding out Piero LeFou can use him as a hollow projecting spy droid, though that is really fucked up in more ways than one. No, the worst episode is number nine, Spike's big syndicate flashback, on account of how it revolves almost entirely around a younger, dumber Vicious. He's more insufferable than ever before here, and appears in practically every scene, save for the flat, emotionless one where Spike hooks up with Julia behind his back. Oh, and he's absent from the obligatory Netflix old boy hallway, in which Spike takes on an entire building full of rival syndicate goons. You know, the thing that killed him in the anime, in order to save Vicious from being executed for killing one of that rival syndicate's members. At the end of that hallway, the show makes the choice to have Spike make the choice to shoot a kid. Not an evil, immortal kid, just a witness to his crimes, which I don't even know what to do with, honestly. It's the thing that convinces him he needs to give up being a hitman and walk the path to redemption, but like, I don't know if that can be redeemed, ever. It's just a bizarre choice for a character the show needs us to like as an audience. And still, somehow, that's not the most off-putting, non-vicious thing about the episode. That would be the episode's primary setting, which is also my least favorite part of the rest of the show, besides Shogun Farquaad. Remember Annie, Anastasia, the gruff, no-nonsense convenience store owner and weapon smuggler who was like a mother to anime Spike in his old life? She goes by Anna and runs a fancy jazz nightclub now, where a good chunk of the syndicate drama takes place, and it is just completely out of step in every respect with the gritty, run-down, working-class aesthetic of Bebop's world. 
It does allow for the show's most direct incorporation of Yoko Kano's music, which is very cool, but nothing else that happens at Anna's is even remotely cool. In fact, every scene that takes place there feels like an even less cool version of the least cool TV show, Gotham. Just a shitty, half-baked film noir pastiche with flat, ridiculous characters, TV-grade extra Dutch cinematography, and boring, go-nowhere dialogue. I never dreamed I'd use the phrase, like Gotham but worse, but here we are! And I fucking hate it here. But perhaps the worst thing about that setting is how it uses Gren. If you haven't watched the original anime, Gren is a combat veteran who fought alongside Vicious in the big war on Titan until Vicious betrayed him and got him court-martialed because Vicious only knows how to do two things. In prison, Gren was pumped full of experimental drugs that threw his hormones out of whack, causing him to grow breasts. When he finally got out, he moved out to an icy mining town on Callisto, where he got a gig as a sax player, had some implied flings among the all-male populace, and met Julia at one point. He didn't choose to become who he is now, but he accepted it and tried to build a new life around it. Then Vicious came back into that life, and consumed by renewed rage, Gren threw it all away for revenge and answers. In that sense, his character works both as a foil for Spike and Faye, and his session, Jupiter Jazz, needed to be a two-parter just to accommodate all that complexity. In live-action Bebop, Gren's backstory has been changed to make them explicitly non-binary, which is a valid interpretation of the character, but also Anna's receptionist, which is total horseshit. Anime Gren was a rich, full character, believably informed but not totally defined by his gender dysphoria, who could kick serious ass and had a transformational impact on two of our protagonists. Netflix Gren does nothing but cheerlead for their blonde bestie Julia and occasionally wander into other characters' stories to deliver sassy exposition. Now, Apparently, the showrunners have big plans for Gren in future seasons, and apparently they were written into season one at the last minute during a hiatus to set that stuff up, which is why they don't actually do much in the plot. But until that pays off, it kinda just feels like they gutted a nuanced, groundbreaking portrayal of gender dysphoria to make way for the most basic form of LGBTQ tokenism. It also just makes this world feel a whole lot smaller to literally drag this character halfway across the solar system so they can be tied into a plot they weren't part of before instead of just letting them have their own story. I do sincerely hope the writers can turn that around, because I like the actor playing Gren, and having actually read that one interview that grossly misquoted them in its headline, they were talking about writing the wrongs of Sleepaway Camp, not Cowboy Bebop. They seem to be a true blue fan who holds an appropriately deep reverence and love for the anime. Not that any of the thousands of people who raged at that headline on YouTube and Twitter ever bothered to find out. Which, I guess, brings us to the question that we're apparently obliged to ask about all remakes in the age of algorithm-friendly outrage. Did Netflix make Cowboy Bebop, quote-unquote, too woke? No. Quite the opposite, actually. Shinichiro Watanabe and his team made a conscious effort to populate the universe of Cowboy Bebop with a full spectrum of skin tones, languages, world cultures, sexualities, and even gender identities. In 1998, not because it was trendy or marketable, but because Watanabe knows that broad representation makes settings more believable, and he's always thought it's important in general. And because he was always aiming beyond Japan at an international audience, with references to everything from DuckTales to Max Headroom to classic kung fu cinema, and signs in tons of different languages, including each end card written in stylish but also accessibly legible block font English, the most widely spoken language on Earth. And those global-minded priorities made Cowboy Bebop one of the best and most widely beloved anime on Earth. 23 years later, the live-action version achieves slightly less diversity, real weird how the big Yakuza boss is a white dude, fellas, but 
To be fair, it does better than most TV shows these days with its main cast. Though, that's actually been a point of contention for some people. Dumb people. Accusations of race swapping have been leveled at the show for casting Mustafa Shakir as Jet Black, which is fucking stupid for a lot of reasons, not the least of which being that Shakir absolutely kills it in the role, emulating the voice and physicality of the anime character perfectly without making it too cartoony. I honestly can't imagine another actor playing Jet better. And again, all of the main crew gives their all to the roles they've been given, even if none of those roles are actually, you know, the characters from the anime. Which is where the real problem lies. Not with the characters' personalities, I'd rather the writers do their own thing well than the anime's thing poorly, but their backstories, which have seemingly been rewritten for the express purpose of neutering every bit of political commentary that was in the original. In the anime, Jet became an ex-cop because most of the guys in his precinct were corrupt, either corporate pawns, syndicate plants, or both, which back in 98 was a very explicit critique of the then-current problem of Japanese police openly colluding with Yakuza. Beyond that, the Cowboy Bebop anime never quite says Ace scab, all space guy. you get it. But it is intensely critical of police and bounty hunters by extension as institutions that serve powerful interests over common people. Even Jet helps the Gate Corporation cover up their culpability in the literal apocalypse just to gain some leverage over them. In live action Cowboy Bebop, Jet lost his job and wife after being framed for corruption by the one bad apple syndicate cop on the whole force, and at the end of his very special episode, he learns a valuable lesson about how all the other cops, even the one who's fucking his ex-wife, are actually pretty stand-up dudes he can trust. In fact, Officer NTR has the moral high ground on Jet in literally every scene he's in, which is pretty much the opposite of what Jet Black's all about. Faye's backstory in the anime, the thing that drove her into a life adjacent to crime, is that she accrued an inescapable mountain of medical debt during her 50 years of cryosleep, which was then exacerbated by a group of con artists who tricked her into taking on even more debt. In the live-action version, she was simply conned by just the one cryosleep con lady who became her mom, with no mention of debt whatsoever. Like, they surgically removed all implication from her backstory that privatized medicine might just be extortion with extra steps. There's also multiple episodes of the anime where it's just like, hey, drugs are kinda cool, right? Which, coming out of a country where they patched an actor out of a video game for doing a bit of blow is a hell of a statement to make. And considering that Netflix reduces Mushroom Samba to an item on a diner's gag menu, probably one this new show doesn't have the guts for. Cowboy Bebop the anime is a pointedly, unapologetically political work of art that bakes a lot of salient insights about our present into its detailed, dystopian vision of the future. Cowboy Bebop The Netflix is a milk-toast, line-towing, toothlessly liberal sci-fi action comedy that just wants to do some cool shootouts without offending nobody or rocking no boats. And that is, in my opinion, its single greatest failing as an adaptation. Aside from ever pointing a camera at this guy, I mean. But Anime Vicious wasn't that important in the grand scheme of the anime, whereas politics and philosophy, heavy ideas presented in a light, fun, jazzy sci-fi rapper, are a key component of the anime's soul as key as its music, which Netbop also screws up, but not all the time and not with such clear intent. Not necessarily malicious intent. Showrunner Andre Nemec has said they took the dystopian elements out to make Bebop's future feel more, quote, hopeful and nostalgic. But as an anime, Cowboy Bebop looks forward, not back. 
It knows there's no use clinging to a comfy, long-gone past. Now, some of you might argue that I'm projecting what I want to see onto Cowboy Bebop because of my own personal political biases. I mean, I think those themes are fairly self-evident. There's a reason that the most persistent existential threat to Bebop's crew is being broke. But we do live in a world where people say Squid Game is about socialism, so one can never be too careful with these things. Luckily, I'm enough of a Cowboy Bebop nerd to be into the the extended universe, and it fully backs up this interpretation. Carolyn Tuesday is the Watanabe-directed, canonical 20th anniversary sidequel to Cowboy Bebop, in which a young black refugee on Mars finds her musical soulmate in a white, upper-class runaway, and together they use the communicative power of music to subvert the hateful, anti-immigrant campaign of Tuesday's politician mom, Valerie Simmons. So. That's an explicit indictment of Trumpism, but framed around an obvious Hillary Clinton analog. Watanabe's not simply decrying racism as an issue on one side, but implying that they're really two sides of the same neoliberal Martian supremacist coin. Though, just to be clear, there is so much more to Carolyn Tuesday than just that message. Just like there's infinitely more to Cowboy Bebop than dire warnings about what profit incentives to cut corners will do to privatized space infrastructure. Carol and Tuesday overflows with love and good vibes. It taught me a ton about music, and if you view the AI-generated songs in it as a metaphor for Watanabe's feelings about computer-assisted animation, it also goes a long way toward explaining why we haven't really had another show like Bebop in the last 20 years. I highly recommend watching Carol and Tuesday. Highly, if you catch my drift. Like Bebop, I think anyone can enjoy it regardless of their political views. But that message is still there, and it couldn't be louder or clearer. That's just how Shinichiro Watanabe rolls. Most of his works wear fiery political takes on their sleeves. The man made an anime where the protagonists are literal terrorists taking on the Japanese government for Haruhi's sake. I hate the word woke, but if we must talk in those terms, Cownet Botflix is demonstrably and substantially less woke than the original. And it's exhausting, honestly, to be stuck in an online discourse landscape where half the people discussing the new show, many without having watched it or even seemingly the anime, are just pretending that's not true to perpetuate their culture war narrative. A landscape where people are seriously arguing that Squid Game, the show about debtors being coerced into blood sports for the amusement of the filthy rich, is really about how socialism is bad because they wear tracksuits, line up for bread, and the game's odds fixer said equality once. Wait, I don't know why this keeps happening. I guess it feels like losing to admit that a thing you like, which is also very popular, represents political views you disagree with. I kinda get that, and maybe I've contributed to that atmosphere to a degree by slamming shows like Dragon's Dogma and High School Prodigies specifically for their stupid ham-fisted politics. So to offer a counterpoint, I, like most people who watch anime, fucking adore Attack on Titan. Attack on Titan happens to be written by a conservative Japanese nationalist military history buff, and I genuinely do not think its low fantasy world building or its portrayal of warfare and tactics would be nearly as interesting as they are if Hajime Isayama was not the person he is. I also think the series' thoughtful indictments of isolationism, imperialism, and ethno-nationalism carry more weight in some ways, coming from someone with conservative values than they would from a former card-carrying kami like Miyazaki. You may also remember that I made a whole video about how High School of the Dead is the coolest, funnest, and explodiest zombie thing in existence, and that shows about a Japanese everyman, his hot sojutsu master and hot lady samurai girlfriends, an otaku gun nut, and a hot nurse with a JSDF hookup teaming up with a far-right nationalist militia and, later in the manga, some cool gun-toting cops to save useless liberals from zombies. The show and manga ain't subtle about pushing agendas I vehemently disagree with, but they're so fucking fun, I don't care. Likewise, I love Log Horizon's economic strategy action. 
everything to do with Shiro running his business is fascinating, and that's pretty much the most libertarian anime this side of My Wife is a High School Girl. I love all of these shows as much or nearly as much as Bebop or Nausicaa or Kaiji because the people making them are artists first and foremost. Those political statements are simply essential to portraying humanity the way each artist sees us. And those insights into how different people think and view the world are one of the most fascinating and valuable parts of art, at least to me. So it really fucking bums me out that we can't have full, honest conversations about Attack on Titan or Cowboy Bebop and what they're really saying without someone screaming at someone else. Or praise Attack on Titan at all in certain circles. This definitely isn't a one-sided problem. Though I do think one side of it is worse, or at least more aggressive, and a big part of me is worried I'm wasting my breath with this, because dishonest people who want to keep the profitable parts of the outrage engine turning can just cherry-pick the most disagreeable parts of this video, the same way they're doing with the most disagreeable parts of the live-action show and interviews surrounding it, to present without context or nuance as discrediting evidence to an audience that loves hating things they're also very proud of never having watched. But I can't just ignore this aspect of Bebop either, because it's a massive component of the anime's world and one of the key missing ingredients that makes Netflix's solar system feel so hollow and small. And more than that, because one of the most miraculous things about Cowboy Bebop is its ability to make these statements so loudly while being embraced by folks across the political spectrum. Even ignoring the mountain of substance behind it, the style the style of Cowboy Bebop represents the single most immaculate and immersive vibe in all of anime. And the emotional core of its cast, disconnected from their backstories, has a near universal resonance. And if nothing else, I mean, not if, there is almost literally nothing else, but the new production team does at least seem to have a suitable appreciation and respect for those aspects of the original Bebop. They certainly don't nail it. The best episode of this show ain't half as good as the worst of real Bebop, Boogie Woogie Feng Shui, but they do understand it. And as Hollywood approximations of anime vibes go, I mean, they got McDonald's in there, Big Shot is pitch perfect, the ship's goddamn interfaces, that's not nothing. And while not all of the writers really get the characters, the actors clearly do. Like I said at the top, we can't stop this show from existing now, or even from getting a second season, most likely. And resisting it head on will only frustrate us further. But we can still be like water, flow as a fandom around it, and help push it in a better direction with constructive criticism. So how could this show, inspired by Cowboy Bebop, actually earn the prestigious title that licensing money bought for it? For starters, just have Julia fucking shoot Vicious, or at least keep him down in that dungeon where we can't see or hear him. Trust me, no one will miss him. And maybe also do way less Julia? I'm assuming Velaju's history on Titan will tie in with whatever the series plans are for Gren, but with Anna shutting down the club and going on the lam, they don't actually need to interact with Julia for that. I know you got plans, but maybe try doing a few seasons with completely different villains. Just see what happens. That's all I'm saying. Oh, and speaking of... We have to find Velaju, Velaju, Velaju! To use a TV exec term, Ed really ain't testing well, but we've only seen one scene of her, and there is still time to rework her character between seasons. Eden Perkins is clearly bursting with energy and enthusiasm for the role, and if you can just channel that into something less 90s video game commercial that fits with the energy of the core cast, that could be really fun. I know this goes against most modern binge TV wisdom, but it would also probably pay to downplay the continuity and focus more on episodic bounty hunt adventures with charismatic one-off villains and compelling one-off side characters who give the core cast something new, fun, and interesting to play off of. That's the part of the anime I think most fans would want to see extended in a multi-season adaptation, and frankly, it's clear that's what your writers and actors are best at, too. 
Also, on that note, please give Alexandra E. Hartman and Carl Taro Greenfeld more episodes, because they're clearly the strongest assets in your writer's room by far, and they seem to have a much better grasp on these characters and the general Bebop vibe than Christopher Yost or Sean Cummings. But more importantly, for all of the writers, make it a hard, unbreakable rule that they must be listening to Yoko Kano's OST at all times while they are working. Burn each and every song into the deepest corners of your minds, and look for every opportunity you can find to integrate them into your action and dialogue. Try to have music say things the characters can't or won't for once. It doesn't matter how hard your production designers go on the costumes and sets, how hard your actors work, or even if you work the politics and philosophy back into the script, if this show isn't intrinsically, infectiously musical, it will never be Cowboy Bebop. And with that in mind, your music department and sound department really ought to be the same thing. It is extremely, painfully obvious that they aren't talking to each other nearly enough. In anime production, a single sound director coordinates all music, voice, and sound effects, and this show desperately needs somebody in that role so it can stop utterly wasting Yoko Kano's unrivaled genius. I'd also say to walk back the warm nostalgia blanket shit a bit and turn this solar system back into a systemically flawed dystopia, partly because I personally find that aspect of the anime's world to be its most fascinating, but mostly because it makes no goddamn sense for likable, relatable people to be hunting other human beings for a living if there isn't some dire economic shit pushing them into it. Cowboy should be a pejorative term in this setting. Also, this world just has a lot more potential for dynamic storytelling when syndicates and eco-terrorists aren't the only big bads around. You could use Bohemian Rhapsody as a springboard for a whole seasonal plotline about the Gate Corporation trying to silence the Bebop crew, have some of the seedier elements of ISSP come after them while they're trying to clear their good names of some crime they've been framed for, or just do an episodic storyline or two where it slowly becomes clear that the bounty head's just taking the fall for some rich asshole's mistake. That sort of twist is the bread and butter, or beef and bell peppers, of actual Bebop script writing, and Netflix Bebop is seriously kneecapping itself by trying to present a mostly good, functional society with some crime problems. But we've barely seen Earth, or most of the solar system outside Mars for that matter, so there is still plenty of space, literally, to reincorporate those anti-corporate themes moving forward. Netflix Bebop Season 1 is not, on the whole, good television. At a lot of points, it is terrible, near-unwatchable television. But there is more potential here for future good content than I've seen in, well, any live-action anime thing this side of Alita. Certainly a hell of a lot more than there was in Death Note. And even if they ignore all the criticism and keep making mostly garbage, at least we'll probably get some more Seatbelts albums out of it. There's not a Cowboy Bebop fan alive who'd be mad at that. And if the new show helps the younger, algorithm-driven generation discover the timeless magic of the original, that'd be pretty cool too. Seriously, if you haven't watched the anime, there isn't even a shred of crust on it. It's still fresh. It'd be cooler if this was a good TV show also, but if Spike Spiegel can accept a kid, a dog, and a woman with attitude into his life, I can learn to live with this. Except for Vicious. Fuck Vicious. I'm Jeff Thu, professional Vicious hater, signing out in a hail of syndicate gunfire.